Okay, um, I think the first thing to say is that it's, uh, this is the coldest I've been since the last time I was in Palestine, which might strike some people as a bit odd. It, it struck me as odd the first time. I've been quite a few times, and obviously most of the time it's very, very hot, but I turned up one time in February, completely underdressed for Palestine in February because it's a, incredibly cold, but the Palestinians have a way of dealing with this. They just put extra layers on. So they all, all the kids walk around like this because they can't bend their arms because they've got that many clothes on. It's freezing. Okay, um, comrades... I don't know about you, but, but um, I get incredibly frustrated that with monotonous regularity, I have to, and you have to, we have to take to the streets because yet again, the Israelis are bombing Gaza or the West Bank or attacking Palestinians. And this has been a regular part of my political activity. I was thinking uh, about this particularly as I was sitting next to Greg because I was at Glasgow University from 80 to 84 and the first big Palestinian campaign I was involved in was at Glasgow University when we twinned the university with uh, Bears Lake University. And I think that was in 83, if my memory sends it, says it right. And almost every two or three years since then, there has been yet another attack by the Israelis on the Palestinians at some, at some place. And the horror just continues. And I think it's incumbent on us to try and get some grasp of, well, where does this horror come from? And how, what are the responses? How can we think about a solution to the Palestinian problem? And a solution that just doesn't throw our hands up in despair at the brutality of the Israeli state, but doesn't have a solution to that. And if we want to get to the roots of this, I think we have to have some understanding of the roots of Israel itself, uh, the way in which it operates as a state and the impact it has on the Palestinians. So I've got 10 minutes to do the entire uh, history of Israel, so it might be a bit quick and a bit rapid, but let me try and see if I can go on. The first question, so there's three main points really. The first, main, the first point I want to look at is where did the state of Israel come from? And we have to have a bit of an understanding of that at the end of the 19th century. And at the end of the 19th century, there was a European problem, and the European problem was anti-Semitism. And amongst the Jewish community across Europe, there was lots of different responses in the face of that. The most popular one, actually, was to join and, for, uh, to join and be members of the Bund, which was the socialist and labour organisations that held across much of the, uh, of the pale of Jewish settlement around uh, what we could call Eastern Europe uh, today. But in that same context, there was also an alternative idea that developed, and that was an idea that was called Zionism. Is an idea of Jewish nationalism because this was the period, this was the era of new nationalisms and new state building projects. And one of the leaders, one of the first founders of the ideas of, of a Jewish nationalism, Herzog, went out around the main powers in Europe looking to see if he could get support from all the various European imperial powers at the time. Germany, France, Britain. He courted all of them to see if any of them would support the setting up of an exclusive Jewish state uh, in any part of the world. I say in any part of the world because it wasn't going to be necessarily in the Middle East. One of my favourite stories is that one of the earliest uh, parts of the world that they thought about was a place called Patagonia, which is in Argentina. And so some of the uh, Jewish uh, Zionist migrants from Eastern Europe left to go to Patagonia. And today in Argentina, they are still known as the Jewish cowboys, the Judea, uh, Gaucho Judea. They still, that's all they've done for the rest of the time. They haven't gone to Israel, but that's what they thought the promised land was going to be uh, about. Very quickly, it became not Patagonia, not Argentina, but the ancient homeland of, uh, of Israel. And they quoted the various uh, imperial powers. There's a couple of important dates. If you were sitting through uh, the book launch that Dave did earlier on about the impact of the First World War, and obviously this is the centenary of it, there are a number of important dates that happened through the First World War that are part of parcel of the creation of the state of Israel. The first one is that during the First World War, Britain does what it always does, we played both sides at the same time. So on the one hand, as T.H. Eliot was, you know, promising, uh, Lawrence of Arabia was, wrong one, Lawrence of Arabia was promising uh, the um, freedom for the uh, Arab peoples uh, against the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, the Balfour Agreement was signed, which promised a Jewish, an exclusive Jewish homeland in Palestine for the Jewish peoples of Europe. Britain played both sides of that equation. Slightly later, there was a, a second piece of a, 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 rope, a, a report called the, the agreement called the sykes pico Agreement. And it was basically how the Ottoman Empire was going to be carved up. And that's important because in the carve up, Britain got the mandate for Palestine, which we had already promised for Jewish migration and to, to become the Jewish state. So from the very beginning, Britain's hands are all over the original problem of Jewish migrants from Europe 
starting to locate to Israel, uh, to Palestine, with the support of the British state to have their, their, their homeland in a land that, in the, uh, the phrase of uh, Golda Meir, was a, 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 this was a land without people, and they were a people without a land, and so they were returning to a land where there was nobody there that they could just take the land over. Of course, for hundreds and hundreds of years, there had been Palestinians there, and they were Palestinian uh, Jews, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims, who had lived in relative harmony until empire got their hands all over the equation, and they had lived there for hundreds of years in relative harmony. But that started to change as Jewish uh, migrants from Europe, with the support of the British, started to move in to Israel. Jumping very quickly, the next main big turning point, really, is at the end of the Second World War. It's still uh, a, a, a British mandate, but Britain is moving out very, very quickly. And because of the horrors of the Holocaust, the argument is that, that the British state should really turn a blind eye to the migration of, of those who are fleeing the aftermath of the Holocaust and who are coming to, to Israel. It's, it's worth stating that although Israel has always claimed to be the safe haven for Jews in the world and necessary in the, in the background of the Holocaust, for most Jewish migrants throughout the whole of the 20th century, if they were given a choice about where they want to go, it's actually not to Israel, but like most migrants from Italy or Ireland or wherever it was, they wanted to go to the country that was known in the land of the free, they wanted to go to America. But actually, at the end of the Second World War, people were being diverted into Israel at that, at, at that time. As, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the migrants come into Israel, we go through a period which, the, um, which has sometimes been called a period of, of, of ethnic cleansing of Palestine. The, what happens in 1947 and 1948 is completely bar barbaric. And what we find is a, a, a series of uh, Jewish organisations uh, launch a, an, ethnic camp, uh, an ethnic cleansing campaign against the Palestinians who are living there. The organisations are Ergun, the Stern Gang, uh, the Haganah, which was a militarised police force, and the Palmesh, who had been trained by the British during the Second World War as a parachute regiment, uh, effectively to fight the Germans in North Africa. These four organisations were incredibly well armed militarily and were actually very, very well trained. And they launched assaults against Palestinian towns and villages and forced people to flee from their homes. Like many migrants, they took with them a few belongings, they took with them the keys, and they took with them the property deeds to their lands. They were refugees. And they thought they were going for six weeks or six months or six days, and they have been gone for 65 years from their homes, not allowed to return to those places so many years later. And the intractable problem of Israel and Palestine is the problem of the refugees and their right to return, because that is a right that is, that is denied them. The reality is that the state of Israel does two things. First of all, it has a right of return for any, any Jewish person born anywhere in the world has the right to return to Israel and take up citizenship. And yet, Palestinians born out, outside in the refugee camps in Lebanon or in the West Bank or born in Syria or born in Britain, whose homes were in Palestine but they were ethnically cleansed from it, they do not have the right to return to their family land in any, in any way whatsoever. So, 47, 48, it's set up, but it has a problem, and that is how is it going to establish itself? And it establishes itself by, esta by establishing itself as what, what they called, or what uh, Haaretz, the, the main uh, liberal newspaper in, in, in Israel, called uh, by establishing itself as a watchdog state. What, the, what that meant was that Israel has its own interests in the region, its own interests over other countries, and its own uh, interests as an economic and political military power. But it has also got the interests at heart today of the American imperial, uh, imperial forces. They get huge amount of resources to provide for their welfare state, to provide for their army. They are the biggest recipient of aid from the American state goes to Israel to provide those things. And the watchdog state means that at times the Americans unleash the watchdog to carry out their tasks for them. That sounds a bit abstract. Think about the war of 2006 on Lebanon. It seems to me that that's the best example of it. If we think about 2006, in, the, uh, in Iraq. Brit um, Britain and America were struggling in Iraq. There was a lot of talk at that time that they were losing because of the, uh, the, the, the Shia armies, the Shia militia in, uh, in uh, Sada city. And at the time, there was discussion of something called the Shia Crescent. In other words, that money, was, money and arms were coming from Iran into Sada city, into the Shia uh, militias. They were, re they were forcing the Americans back. The Americans were facing a major military defeat. The Shia Crescent continued up into Lebanon, where Hezbollah were the recipients of that 
of, of, of those arms and those sources. America wanted to deal with that problem, but they were in Afghanistan, they were in Iraq, they were losing in both places. They couldn't afford to have another war either in Lebanon or against Iran. And therefore, what they did was they launched a proxy. Israel was the, if you like, was the tool, was the watchdog who went into Lebanon to deal with Hezbollah as a way of dealing with the Americans' problems in Iraq. And that, I think, is what we mean by the watchdog state. So we can see how Israel operates with its own interests, but tied absolutely into the interests of global imperialism and into the interests of American imperialism in that way. So given that, how can we think, how can Palestine properly be free? And the Palestinians, one of the remarkable things is that over the last 65 years is the resilience of the Palestinians to keep on going. If you think about the curfews and the military occupation and the stop and search and the amount of times that people were arrested, it's the, it's the, it, uh, if you're born today a young boy in Palestine, you have a one in three chance that you are going to end up in prison for no crime. You'll be picked up under administrative detention. It is, you know, it's, they are imprisoned, they're harassed, they're locked down, and yet they continue to fight. But we have to learn very quickly the lessons. They have learned to fight in lots of different ways. They have heroically fought through the struggles of the PLO in the 60s and the 70s, but they didn't and couldn't, through terrorist, through terrorist strikes, take on the might of the Israeli army. And in Beirut, in the early 1981-82, were militarily and significantly beaten in that way. Then there was the first and second intifada. The first intifada was different from the second because it involved massive numbers of people across the whole of Israel involved in all sorts of popular rebellions. That's what forced Israel to concede the, 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 the West Bank and Gaza Strip. It was, the, it was the mass movements that were there. The second intifada was much more military in its, in its outcome, much more military in orientation, and in terms of outcomes, didn't achieve a huge amount for the Palestinians. But there is one thing that kept up the Palestinians going, and that has been the interaction. On the one hand, of both the, the struggles of the, palace of the Arab peoples, and in particular, over the last few years, the Arab Spring. As the Arab Spring went up, the hopes for a liberated Palestine were much, much greater than they've been for many years to go. And so in the Socialist Workers' Party, we always have a slogan. We say that the road to liberation for Palestine comes through Cairo. We don't mean by that the Egyptian armed forces. We certainly don't mean that the Egyptian armed forces at the present time. But what we mean is an example, uh, is the example of Cairo and Alexandra, of the organized working class of Egypt and the Middle East, which we've seen over the last three, four years, has the potential to be an incredibly powerful force for reshaping not only Egypt and their own countries, but the whole of the Middle East region and bringing with it the liberation and freedom of Palestine. The liberation of Palestine will come through the organized masses across the whole of the, of the, whole of the Arab region. It will start in places like Cairo. It will liberate the Palestinian people. And part of that means that we have to keep the light burning for a free, liberated Palestine as part of a socialist federation of the Middle East.